Today we sit down with Adam Blythe, ex-professional cyclist, ex-British champion and current Eurosport pundit and commentator. Welcome Adam. Thanks for having me. How are we doing? Fine, thank you. How are you? I'm all right, yeah. I'm all right. <laughs> so let's jump straight in. Um, what's your story? How did you get to be a cyclist? Where did you start? How did you start? Uh, I started when I was super young. I was five years old, I think, when I went to this. It was just like a local car park. I think um, where it was used used to be for like drivers who were like 16 just before they started driving tests. So it was like an old rundown warehouse. And I had a massive car park with it and used to have little cycling clubs for kids. We used to go there every Wednesday, I think it was. We just used to race around this little track, basically, around the old grounds of this industrial estate and that's how I started my old man used to be a cyclist as well so that helped a little bit my granddad um and yeah I just loved it instead of doing the old football and rugby and that kind of stuff I still did that within school but it was just an extra activity after school that we went and did so did that and that's how I got into it really and I, I don't know it's not getting into it I just used to love riding my bike like going out playing on my bike and just the same as going to the park kicking a football around or whatever it might be that's that's all I did and Realised I was quite good at it. Went to a lot of races when I was young and then just kept racing, 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 racing. It was just like, um, it was natural progression, not progression, but naturally the more you did, the better you got, the better yeah. you got. And it just carried on from there. So so, at so what point did you realise that actually cycling is going to have a big part of your life or play a big part in your life? Um, from young, you know, I think I was like 10, 12. We used to go to, not even, seven or eight, we used to go to Holland race right. over there there was a couple of us um who i met at that same track who are a couple of my best friends now we just used to parents would take us to holland it'd be like a little mini vacation for them and we just race our bikes and from then it took a lot of time you know especially my parents time um so that was it really but i think from sort of 10 i still used to do other sports but i'd just go and ride yeah. my bike every weekend just meet my mates who rode bikes go and ride our bikes and then as I said, just after school, just go and knock about my bike, play down the local skate park or whatever it was. And that's how I sort of did it. It's, it's interesting what you said about parents because what, since we've, we've launched the Elite Pathway, it's been clear what and how much parents do. As, 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 obviously, they played a massive part in, in you becoming what you became. Yeah, massive. You don't really, I don't know, you don't realise. I've got kids now and it's until you have kids, you don't really realize as much like the weekends they just used to commit to my sister used to ride a bike as well so she'd come with us wherever we went she'd race i'd race but it was monumental but it's till you get older you don't really realize because it was just fun for us so yeah. I'd just go away and it was you'd go away for a fun weekend of doing what we loved it was just great fun able to kick about not kick about but ride about and just have fun with our mates at the time so it was brilliant. I never really thought about it until I was old, like I said. And then once you are older, you get a bit more of a deeper appreciation for it, for your parents not going out with their friends at the weekends yeah. and all that. So, yeah, I'm massively and forever will be thankful for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. So at what point, you obviously became national or British champion yeah. in 2016. Um what do you put that down to? I know we're sort of, it's very sort of very genetic to, or generic to talk about um, your hard work and, and everything else you put into it. But obviously, you talk about from where you started to become British champion. What what do you put that down to? And, and like I said, I know it's, it's probably a lot of hard work. But is there anything else that you think actually this is actually really important to my progression or, or, or where I've got to? Yeah, me. Per it was really difficult actually. So me personally, it's like anything in life that you do. You've got. If you say you've got to come in and do this job and you love doing that job, but the more you do it and someone keeps telling you, you need to do it like this, you need to do it like that, you're not doing it right, do it like this. And it's ultimately the same job what you're doing. But the hard bit was is I knew what worked for me and that wasn't right on, say, the coach's paper or anything. So it doesn't sound ideal, but I basically ignored my coach because what he was telling me to do the previous year just didn't work. I was just useless. I wasn't as good as I was. And going into 2016 when I won, I was just myself, you know, I was just like, right, I'm going to do what I know works best. I'm going to crack on with that. I got in a lot of trouble for it, for not following their coaching and guidelines. I was still doing the training, but just what I wanted to do, not them. And ultimately I was just enjoying going out on my bike. So I'd just go out, I trained super hard, um, but I'd just do it my way. Um, and I had a couple of close friends who were coaches and I'd get advice do you think this is right? Do you think that's right? And they'd be like, no, try doing that, try doing this. And it would be, it'd always be if I went out training, I'd always have it in the back of my mind. 
maybe try doing that, maybe try doing this. But it was just down to me going out and loving training. Yeah. So I used to, I never, I don't like the process of training. I don't like starting and getting to the end point. I'd just rather get to that end point. Yeah. And just that stress of trying to get through from here to there, but you've got a race in between it. So you'd be trying to get to there, but you'd have to do a race when you form and your fitness was here. And that would be the hard part for me. It's like, I've been doing all this work and I'm still not there. Yeah. I'm still getting a kick in. So you'd have to go back. And it's just about keeping that motivation and morale almost. I know it sounds stupid and simple, no, but the love for it yeah. is what I thrived off. And if I was happy and I was motivated to do that training, yeah. what I knew I wanted to do, rather than someone saying, you've got to go out and do that. And if you put it in sort of layman's terms, if someone says, you've got to go and run a, a 5K so if you could do a 5K run in 15 minutes, yeah. but someone says to you, you've got to go and do it in 20 minutes, it's easy to do the 20 minutes. It's just when you have to do the 15 minutes, that's yeah. when it becomes hard. So for a coach saying, you need to go and do the 15 minutes, whereas I go out and do 16 minutes or 17 minutes, yeah. but then I might go out and do a 14 minute 5K. It, was, it wasn't as structured as what, my coaches liked and they just could not deal with it. They couldn't get their head around it. Yeah, so that's really, again, it's really interesting that because we've been friends for a few years mm. now um, and I am certainly not a cycling expert at all. At um, all. At all. At all, literally <laughs> no knowledge in cycling whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but when I was looking um, around and um, reading some quotes and sort of delving into your professional life that I've had no experience but that was of, a big dig. <laughs> <laughs> no experience of whatsoever. I know you as, uh, of course, you as a very good friend, but I didn't know anything about you as a professional. Yeah. Um, and there was a few things that I read that really struck me. Um, and I hope that I'd, I'm not offending you when I say this, but one of the quotes that I read online was there was one gentleman said that Adam was one of the most naturally talented riders of a generation that didn't live up to his potential. And and, it, and that was interesting when you said about not listening to the coaches. Was that a perception? Is that something that you feel? True fact. Okay. It's a true fact. <laughs> no, I did. I was, um, without trying to sound really arrogant, I was very, very good. I was really talented. And I could always, I could get through a bike race just purely on talent. You'd still have to train, but a lot of my results are just purely on talent and knowing where to be, knowing what to do at the right time and just not relying on fitness. I just always rely on my natural ability. Yeah. Um, so I did that a heck of a lot. I think the um, when I look at the races I've won and what I was able to do within a bike race, um, that was that me at my full potential. When I won, it was it was like, right, okay. When I won the Nationals, I beat Mark Cavendish, who was like the greatest sprinter of all time. And I beat him in a sprint. And it was kind of like, right, that's Adam at his best. Yeah. But I'd like to get to that and then after that, I'd be like, right, I've done that. Let's carry on to the next thing, yeah. whatever it was. But I loved, I just you, love life. You know, I just, cycling for me is, I've been doing it so long that it was a hobby, it was a passion. But it was that little bit of, I've got another life just outside of cycling as well. And I think when you really, when you really delve into it, I had kids then, one child, and it was kind of, I've had to do it life got harder at home yeah. more time at home more time with the family and it was the way up of what's more important yeah. and family overweighed the bike to me then so it was it's, it's kind of difficult to put it into perspective of professional athletes but there's one thing that i do stand by is that within cycling you've got a minimum salary which is still a very good salary but you've got your high salaries which are like up in the millions yeah you know? and if you've got a family of three and you can afford to get care for your kids if you can afford to take your wife out of work yeah that makes life and training so much easier you don't have that stress at home i wasn't that so you've got to juggle all that along with it so it's just for me it was just i'm not going to say life got in the way but normal life to me was just as important if not more important than bike riding yeah no i i, I can i could totally understand that um and that sort of answered the, the sort of thing things that were sort of coming out online that when you became british british champ you didn't do anything the year after, yeah. And that, and, and you put it on that you chose then between your family and cycling. Yeah. So understanding that actually cycling wasn't is is a, is a massive part of your world, but it wasn't everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
and and one of the other things that I, that I sort of that I sort of found when I when I was looking looking at you in, in a bit more detail, uh, one of the things you said was hench. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ripped. <laughs> I didn't go up, weirdly. Um, you said that you you weren't the best rider, but you thought you were, and I, and I think that's that's really important and, and really interesting because what we're doing with our students at the minute is when they when our elite students go down to Loughborough, they work with their psychologists. Mm. So when that when I read that, that really stood out to me that actually you you weren't the best. I mean you were very, very good, but you thought you were. Now, now that's that's a really interesting mindset. Mm. That when, when I look back at at my very amateur football career, I never think that I never thought I was good enough. Ever. Yeah. Even though I'm, I was okay. And, and I did all right. I never thought I was good enough. So it's interesting to see what you th- what your thoughts are behind that. Yeah. So it, I never thought I was the best. There was a couple of times where I knew I was the best, but that is rare within within any sport that you yeah. know you're best, unless you're like the Messi's or whoever it is within in sport. But I knew I wasn't the best, but I had to tell myself going into every race that I knew I was better than everyone so it wasn't a case of I know that I can't win today but I have to have the arrogance about me I have to have the belief in myself where I know I'm better than you at doing this I know I'm better than you at doing that and that was just the way I don't know if you look at any sort of sports person they've got an arrogance about them yeah I think it's respecting your peers and everything else they do but no one goes into that race thinking I can't I can't go past that guy because he's better than me it's like no come on you're you're like you're trying to win this race you're trying to do what you need to do. So for me, it was always, you've got to believe you're better than the, the person you're up against, the hundreds of people I was up against. If you believe you're better than me, even though you're not, you've already got 10% on them. If you're, you know, someone that's got the, the best form in the peloton, the best fitness, even if you can sort of mentally look like you're better than them, treat them like you're better than them and respect them, but have that sort of aura of arrogance around you where you're not going to let them see that you're weak yeah and that was it that was the whole thing for me is that i knew i wasn't as strong as them always i, I wasn't a big engine um so it was always to me is just make sure that they're always doubting you make sure they're always how's he feeling what what's he doing today you know oh he's got good legs and you know it's just that kind of i never wanted anyone to see my weakness yeah i'd always want people to be where well, is he going to do that oh no he's not going to do that you know it's just mm. that whole it's like I said, being respected and respecting your others, but also being quite arrogant, really, about how good I was as a professional, yeah. even though a lot of the time I wasn't that good. But what, when you say you're arrogant, when when I when I know you as as a friend, that doesn't come across at all. So it's sort of it's two different people. Like I said, when I I was very open that when I when I when I first met you, I didn't know anything about cycling, but I but your personality made me want to be your friend as, as, as daft as that sounds but Cheers, mate. Thanks, I like that. <laughs> but, 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 you know, the, the arrogancy that you speak about is is really interesting so it's it's having that that person who's on and off the field or the track yeah and the person on the track is that hard is, is it hard to or is it just something that's become so natural to you because you've competed so long it's natural i think do you know if you if we went and played football i know that you'd be better than me but I know that I'd be able to do. <laughs> but I know that I'd be able to do some things better than you. I'd be able to run around for longer. I'd be able to run around. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. And I'd use that to be. Yeah. To try and beat you in a kind of way. It's that that arrogance that I know you're better at this sport. But I know there's elements of this sport within running where I'm better than you at it. <laughs> I'm not being arrogant by saying that. But, <laughs> but you know, it's like you might be quicker at running past me in a sprint and all that kind of stuff. But if I can some way manipulate this game and just boot a ball miles away, yeah. so you have to keep running, eventually <laughs> I'll start getting one up on I'm a little bit offended. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I think that's the whole thing with it. It doesn't matter what sport it is. It's just being that competitive person and wanting to just just use whatever I could within something to try yeah. and beat you and that, that would be it yeah no it is no it is it's, it's, it's really really interesting um, if you could have your time again yeah would you do anything differently oh yeah yeah <laughs> I wouldn't so when I was young I, I moved out in the south of France and I it was a very lovely lovely place where I lived and it was it wasn't Monaco was it it was Monaco you've not, yeah. you've yeah, not, not mentioned, mentioned that Monaco, now no. but um, when I lived down there I was young and through cycling my whole career, 
I never got to have that sort of 17 to sort of 21 age yeah. where you go and do normal stuff. And when I moved there, I was, I was getting good money at the time. And I just, I didn't let loose a little bit, but I just let my hair down a little bit, you know, and just in that lifestyle where you could come back from training to go and sit on the beach and all that kind of stuff. You know, I wouldn't change that necessarily, but I'd just look a little bit more seriously at my trainer yeah. and just think, you know, what you've got here is good. But at the same time, I don't know where I'd be now. Yeah, I understand. Does that boil down to going back to that statement of <laughs> of never reaching the potential? You were oh, so yeah, natural, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, you, you were sort of, you've been cycling for so long when you were given that freedom. It played a part in, in your development, or is that unfair to say? No, it's fair to say, yeah. It was, like I said before, I just love normal aspects yeah, of life. Yeah. I just love and living lots of a normal that, I life. Yeah, and I think a lot of people do, you know. I think there's... I think when the money's there, you know, it's sadly we rely on money for everything in life. Mm. And I think then I didn't rely on it so much and I wasn't that aware of how much it was. When I look back, I think, oh, yeah, I should have probably taken it a bit more seriously, earned a bit more money. And I'd, I'd probably still be riding now if I did. But if I was as successful on the bike, I'd have still probably needed to work after. Yeah. But then the longer it got, yeah. I don't know if I'd be doing what I do now. And I yeah. love doing what I do now just as much as... Riding yeah. my bike still. Yeah. No, no, because you retired early. Yeah. Um, and again, that, that I suppose that was boiled down to your, to your life choice. Now, I, I, I know about mm. the, your circumstances and, and your partner and your, and your brilliant young family. But then that was a decision you made at 29, wasn't it? You retired yeah. at 29. So when, when I first met you, that was sort of, you were having that period where you were about to finish. So I, so I didn't yeah, just yeah, be yeah, yeah. to find that about. But that's what you put it down to is that you chose the family life in the end because it just meant more to you. Yeah, that was exactly it. It was family life. So I've got twin girls um, at home, a little boy as well, all very close in age. And it's just difficult to juggle yeah. everything, you know. It's just, it was what more important. I can all, I can always go out on my bike. You know, that yeah. bike rider is always going to be there. Having a family in those important years of growing up, that yeah. isn't going to be there forever. Yeah. So I just chose that. And, you know, I, I've been doing it for so long, as I said, and I kind of... I didn't lose the love for it, but I, I just couldn't train as much as I needed to. Yeah. And I wanted to. Yeah. But mentally, I just couldn't. Yeah. I just couldn't train as much as I needed to to be good anymore. And it just, every time I went to a race, it was just like banging my head against yeah. the wall. I hated it, you know. And that's just. And it, and I suppose for for the for the for our students and our parents who are listening to this, that's really interesting because there is a lot of external factors that you won't see from a professional athlete that yeah. you, that people won't speak about that. The decisions that people had to make, and 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 those people who, the Messi's and Ronaldo's, are probably had to make sacrifices beyond. Yeah. Oh, yeah, massively. That, that massively. no one even can think about. So, I think sort of as a, as a young athlete, they have the choices to make. But understand, there are other things away from sport. But then to become the best, there has got to be a vast amount of sacrifices to get to where you want to Massive get. Massive sacrifices. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just as sort of, if like I said, we, we we've got a young audience. So if you were to give a bit of advice to any up and coming athlete, whether it be a cyclist or a footballer or a netballer, what what would that what would your one bit of advice be? Have fun. I know that sounds really cliche, but it is just generally have fun. I think the moment that you start getting really serious about it and training every day for it and thinking constantly night and day about it, if you're going to be doing this for a long, long time, it's easy when you get to the top because yeah. you have more support. It's like with Ronaldo's, the Messi's, all the top sports people of the world like Usain Bolt the bigger you are the more support you get so once you're at that top level it's almost easier to stay at the top whereas if yeah. you're always chasing it you've got to have that real motivation and drive and if it's you know the wins or the success that that's your drive keep going for that but also just realize what you're doing and make sure you you can lose sight of what it is it, it can become more of a um, more of a job rather than a hobby. And I think that's when, for especially young kids, you know, when it's becoming such a job at an early young age, you just need to appreciate what you're doing and really try to just embrace all the funness about it. Because it it's not going to be here forever. You're not going to do it until you're 50 years old, you know, 40 years old probably as an athlete, then you'll stop. I don't know the ages between all sports, but I'd say 40 years old, then you're done. And if you look back on your time saying, I've missed out on this, this and this. Yeah. It's not to say go and do those things, but just make sure you're appreciating what you're doing and the love for it, and you're having fun doing it. Because if you go into training, whatever it is, and you're not enjoying it, you, it's not wasting your time, but you're going to have days where you're not going to enjoy training as well. And they're the days where 
if you can get through those days, you're going to get more out of it mentally. Yeah. But if every day you're going and banging your head against a ball, going, oh, I don't want to do this. I'm not having fun of it. Just try and regain that love for it. Try and regain that fun for it. And just make sure it's a passion yeah. rather than a hobby, almost. Yeah. Um, so finally, Adam, what bit of advice would you give to a, a young athlete? A lot of advice. We could go into this for a long time. But the main thing is, for me, it's always been that is have fun. It's like I said earlier, you know, the love for my bike was what pushed me through it a little bit. So I think that's that's the main thing. If you're going to training every day and you love doing it, then keep going with it. Um, also, just be honest with yourself as well. If you're going to training and you're not enjoying it, I think as a kid, you can get pressured into doing things because it's seen as the right thing to do, whereas you're your own person, your own self, and you need to take responsibility a bit for what you love and love doing. I think that's the main thing is if you love going training and you love the process of training, you love the sport, then just keep doing it, go for it all day long, just never give up with it. But if that point comes where you're doubting it or you're not enjoying it, you love the sport and you don't like the training of it, you have to look at it and see what's gone wrong almost. I know that's really difficult for a young kid to do coming up into the sport or at that level that's looking to turn professional, whatever it might be. But I think, yeah, just be honest with yourself, but above all, just go and have fun. Because if fun's not there, it's like anything yeah. in life. If you're not having fun, it's boring, isn't it? Yeah. I agree. Well, Adam, thank you very much for today. Pleasure. Really Thanks appreciate for having it. Me. it was really interesting to to see or to hear about the professional Adam as opposed to <laughs> the friend Adam. So um, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, mate.